Welcome everybody to our little Bible study. And I'm trying to hold a lot of things today. Um, we are covering 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And um, we have this um, little thing here about, um, you know, don't claim your neighbor's mail. And we're going to be talking about that in a minute. And then I have, you know, gas prices. Are you concerned about gas prices? If someone was going to give you free gas, would you take it? Okay, so how about if somebody wants to give you eternal life, would you take that? Mm -hmm. Or would you say, no thanks, I'm good. Mm. Someone wants to give you eternal life, and it's our Lord Jesus Christ. And you should not turn him down. Okay, and the other thing is... Um, we're, we should not whine about gas prices. We are not going through the tribulation. So it's all perspective. And our perspective should be one of gratitude that we're not going through the tribulation because we belong to the body of Christ. Hallelujah. And we went over that last week and chapter 6, mm -hmm. about how we're not going through tribulation. We'll touch on that again today. So, we're taking a closer walk or closer look at um, the scriptures in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 today. And what is the filthiness of the flesh and spirit? What is that? Okay, so we're going to be covering that. And... Um, in Ephesians 4, 1, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. And what is the vocation in Ephesians 4, 1? It is our vocation of being ambassadors here on earth. We are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We represent him here on earth to other people to help them be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory. So we're going to be changed into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ as we behold his word in the scriptures even as by the Spirit of the Lord, 2 Corinthians 3.18. So, His Holy Spirit in us, using His Holy Word, transforms us. But, then that's how we get rid of the, you know, the filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Hmm. So, let's begin with a word of prayer. Mm -hmm. Dear Father God, in Jesus' name we come before you, and we thank you, Lord, for shedding your blood on, on the cross, at Golgotha, at Calvary. Thank you, Lord, that um, you were so heroic and so brave to do that, to go through with obeying the Father even to the point of the death of the cross. And um, then you, you didn't stay then. You rose three days later. And we're so glad that just as you have resurrected, we will be resurrected because we have trusted in what you've done for us. The Son of God died in our place, and we're so grateful. Thank you, Lord. Please help many people to be saved and to come to knowledge of truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, even though we don't have really great voices, we're going to sing a song. Now, what did I do with my song? I laid it down somewhere. Um, here it is. I got it. I got it. Okay. We're going to just sing uh, the first verse and the last verse because we're so grateful 
for what Jesus has done that it makes us want to sing. Okay. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. <laughs> Thank you so much for my assistants, Nancy, Patty, and Cheryl. Um, and so this is going to come into play today because we're going to be talking about God's salvation plan, His glory plan, and how the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished it for us. <clears throat> so again, we're taking a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. What is the filthiness of the flesh and spirit? We're going to be talking more about that next week for chapter 8. Um, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to, that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Ephesians 4.1 So we're called to be his ambassadors here on planet earth. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3.18. So we're not going to have, uh, you know, like a veil over our face. We're going to be open-faced as we look into the scriptures to see what God has told us. 2 Corinthians 3.18, what a verse. Hmm? What a God, what a verse. Okay, so um, we're not going to whine about gas prices because we're living in the best dispensation ever. Okay, even though we're listen, living in this present evil, you know, world, um, as uh, Galatians 1.4 says, we are blessed to be living now when we have the entire, we've had the whole Bible for, you know, for almost 2,000 years, and we have the perfect Bibles for over 400 years. So, um, God says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, Genesis 1.1. Then he says, And the earth was without form, void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Genesis 1-2. So he made something perfect, and then there was a judgment that happened. And then he says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Genesis 1-3. So there's a lot in those verses right there. And you have to kind of read the other parts of the Bible to understand them. Um, I don't understand what you're saying, Penny. Rightly divided. Yeah, right. And we're going to cover that because that's our main thing. Okay, so here I have some water, okay? And we're going to find out. <clears throat> but before I go any further, if you want to be saved and you're not saved, read the first 
five chapters of Romans over and over again until you are saved. That's how you get saved. Okay? Alright. So, <clears throat> now, I'm going to jump to this one. Okay. Why was the earth without form, void, and dark? Because in 2 Peter 3, 5, it says, um, Why was the heavens of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water? 2 Peter 3, 5. So the earth was standing out of the water. Okay, i got to grab this little thing. And in the water. All right. So here is the earth. And now it's standing out of the water and in the water. Oh. Okay. All right. Got to put some more darkness in there. Because <laughs> if we don't have darkness, we're not doing a very good illustration of that verse. So all I'm using is some instant coffee. <laughs> and I had um, egg white on the, on the ball. And to make that instant coffee stick to it. So you can do this yourself. <laughs> okay, so the earth is standing, you know, it's dark and void and you know, without shape because it's getting waterlogged and standing in and out of the water. So why is the earth doing that? Why is that second verse there? Okay, because we're going to find out that Satan and his angels had come down on the earth, okay? And God didn't want them on the earth. So he evicted them. He made it so uh, terrible to live on that earth because of that flooding that they wanted to go off the earth and they went into the second heaven. And so the earth was without form and void and and it was dark. And then God said, Let there be light. Let light. there be light. See? Uh -huh. So God said, Let there be light because they, it was void. It was void of Satan and his angels. So now he says, Let there be light. But he didn't need a flashlight because God himself is light. Mm -hmm. And he hadn't made, you know, the sun, the stars, and the moon yet. He is the light. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is all going to um, make sense, hopefully. But let's let's take a look at this. Don't claim your neighbor's mail. Okay. So some mail in the Bible is for Israel, and some is for the body of Christ. Okay. And we're going to find out <clears throat> that the gospel of the circumcision was given to Peter by Jesus Christ. And the gospel of the uncircumcision was given to Paul. Now, things that are different are not the same. Circumcision and uncircumcision are not the same. Okay? <laughs> Just in case you didn't know. <laughs> so, um, yeah, let's see. We are also going to be talking about um, the New Testament. Why do we have this page in our Bible that says New Testament? Well, it's there to help us. God offers us total forgiveness in Christ by imputed righteousness today. So that's very important to know. Um, now, there were some other things I was going to do. Oh, yeah. I remember. See, here is the Bible. And if you pinch, see how I have this little clothespin? Mm -hmm. If you pinch this little part together, that is Paul's writings. Romans to Philemon. 13 letters. If you cut that out of the Bible, you're removing the body of Christ. Because only Paul talks about the body of Christ. The dispensation of grace was first and only given to Paul, the apostle. 
to the Gentiles. So if you take your Bible, you know that on this side you have past. Here you have now or but now. And over here you have future. Over here you have prophecy. In here you have mystery. Over here you have prophecy again. Over here you had the Old Testament or Old Covenant. Here you have no covenant, but we're still affected by the New Testament. And here you have prophecy and you have the New Covenant. New Covenant. Over here you have Christ's earthly believers. Here you have his heavenly believers. Over here you have his earthly believers again. Hebrews to Revelation. Okay, so um, we have um, past, present, and future. And we have Israel, body of Christ, Israel again. So that's pretty much how your Bible is laid out. So if you remove the, you know, Paul's letters, you pretty much have a, a book about Israel and the Old Covenant and Judaism and the New Covenant, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how you need to look at the Bible because that's how it's laid out. The last bit of the Bible was given to Paul. So God inserted the information about the body of Christ last. And that why did he do that? So that, you know, we're going to talk about that. So that Satan wouldn't prevent the crucifixion. Oh, yeah. Okay, let me put this down. Okay. So, we are going to find out. Okay. That no one can come before the Holy Father without the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So we have to believe that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he... He was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. That the Son of God did that. If you believe that in your heart, you will be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. So, it says um, in Galatians. Galatians was written from Antioch to the Galatians churches in the Galatian territory to explain what happened at the Jerusalem Council. So Paul says um, in Galatians 2, 7 through 9, but contrary wise, when they, that's, you know, um, he, uh, James, John, and Peter, saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, so that me is Paul. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. So Jesus Christ was mighty in Peter, and Jesus Christ was mighty in Paul. And when James Cephas, another name for Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the light went off. The grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. So there was an agreement at the Jerusalem Council that Paul would go to all the lost, all the lost Jews and all the lost Gentiles. And that Peter and his group would only minister to the ones that had already been saved into the little flock. Okay, so it's important to see what's different. So what is the greatest act of love ever? It is what the Son of God has done. Okay, mm -hmm. for us. And we're going to find out that what he did was much more incredible than we could ever think or imagine because he was had great opposition, great 
opposition because there was an assault made against the father and the son. So the religious leaders of Israel tried to take the nation of Israel by force for themselves. Matthew 11:12 and Luke 19:14. Now I have those verses right here. Okay. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Matthew eleven twelve. So you see, they wanted to take the kingdom. The, I mean, they wanted to take the nation and the kingdom for themselves. The Jewish religious leaders. You know, this is how mankind has always been. Mankind has always been rebellious to God. We want to be God. <laughs> we don't want you to be our God. We want to be God, you know. <sighs> okay, so here in Luke 19, 14. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. Luke 19, 14. So they didn't want to have Jesus Christ reigning over them. Okay, so let's talk about the kingdom of heaven. Because that's a term that's used in Matthew a lot, like over 30 times. So um, in Matthew 3, 2, for example, and saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 3, 2, right? So in Deuteronomy eleven twenty one, 21, it's sort of, explains it that your days may be multiplied and the days of your ch children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth so in the land promised to Abraham it's going to be like the kingdom of heaven upon the earth okay that's when the new Jerusalem is going to come down when the Son of God is going to rule there that's when we're going to have peace on earth. Mm. Uh, but we're not going to be there because we're his heavenly group. So that's Deuteronomy 11.21. Okay, so um, over here we have the Son of God brave on the cross and then his resurrection. Okay, so... All right, now God knew all of what was going to happen and he says in um, Psalm 2, which is kind of a little um, summary of um, what, what, you know, history. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? So the heathen are the unsaved and the people are the, the Jews. And the kings of the earth set themselves again, and the rulers take counsel together. Okay, remember when Herod um, counseled with Pilate? Against the Lord and against his anointed. So the Lord here is the Father, and his anointed is Jesus Christ, his Son saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Psalm 2, 1 through 3. So this was when, you know, Christ was on earth. He didn't want, they didn't want him to rule over them. You know, we will not have this king to rule over us. Okay. So in that hostile environment, because Satan had figured out, Daniel's timeline, he had gone and, you know, there was a lot of devil activity in Israel by the time Jesus Christ appeared on the scene. So, you know, Satan was trying to, you know, not allow the kingdom to go to the Son of God. And then he had him, you know, crucified. So, um... We're going to be talking about the mystery iniquity today. Uh, but first, it's important to know that it, 
as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after that the judgment. Hebrews 9.27 So we only have this one life to decide where we're going to spend eternity. Either you're going to burn forever in total torment and darkness, or you're going to have the most incredible life you could ever imagine. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Hebrews 5, 6. Ephesians. I mean Ephesians 5, 6. So um, Ephesians 5, 6 is talking about the children of disobedience. These are the ones that don't believe the gospel. How that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. Those are the disobedient ones. God says, just believe that. And you'll have eternal life. You know? I don't know why anyone would turn such a great deal down. You know, then because the fool has said in his heart, there is no God, right? <laughs> Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so that one man was Adam. Then sin entered, and death entered, and um, it and it passed. Um, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Romans 5.12 For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6.23 So, not only um, did we inherit the sin nature from Adam, but we all have sinned also. So, there's no one on the earth that has not sinned. So the only remedy is what Christ has done. Okay. All right. Now. And he had to do it. He had to do it. Because there was no other way to save us. There was no other way to save us. Okay. But I fear, lest by any means. Okay, this is something that's going to be said later on in um, 2 Corinthians. And I want you to, to see this now. Mm -hmm. At least I have some inkling. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So the simplicity is a message of the cross, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. That's, you know, Christ did it all. All we have to do is believe. Okay? For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus... Okay, what is that other Jesus? That's Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. If someone comes to you and they are preaching to you, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they are trying to beguile you. Sometimes they're ignorant. Most of the time they're ignorant. We were ignorant too. So another Jesus is not Jesus according to the revelation of mystery given to Paul. It is Christ's earthly ministry to Israel. Whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, that other spirit is that spirit that's legalism. Mm. And it's also the spirit of disobedience. You know, it's also, you know, that you might not you might be one of Satan's instead of one of God's. So then you have the spirit of the prince of this air. We're going to be talking about that. Which ye have not received or another gospel. So if you are receiving the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the circumcision, that's not our gospel. Our gospel is the gospel of the uncircumcision. It's the gospel of the grace of God. It's the gospel of Christ. Which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. It's almost like, you know, you want to go with Antichrist? Fine. You know, it's kind of like that. 2 Corinthians 11, 3 and 4. Okay. So, <clears throat> Satan's policy of evil is to conceal the mystery Christ gave to us through Paul. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. If you read um, God's Secret, you'll know a lot about the King James Bible if you look at the appendix. 
Duff is a present ongoing tense. So it's been working and it's continuing to work. Okay, so let's introduce our lesson. But Okay, let me do this one first. God speaks to us through his word. He doesn't speak to us any other way. And we speak to him in prayer. Okay, this is how we communicate with God. And when we pray, we want to pray with an intelligent understanding of his word rightly divided. What is the falling away? We're going to talk about that too. Okay, so let's look at our lesson. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, the heart of Paul and how God comforted him. 1 through 6 of chapter 7. Cleanse ourselves from, let us cleanse ourselves from the filthy flesh and spirit perfecting holiness. 7 through 12, comfort of the Corinthians. So he was comforted of the Corinthians. And then 13 through 16, comfort for their reception of Titus and him. Are all the promises in the book mine? How do we cleanse ourselves from the filthiness of the flesh and spirit? Okay. I will be talking about more of that in the next chapter 8. Why was Paul troubled without and within? How did God comfort him? Why did Paul say, I did repent concerning the letter? The first Corinthians. What is the salvation in 710? What is the cleansing, indignation, desire, revenge in 711? Why did Paul write 1 Corinthians? Why was the spirit of Titus refreshed? How is Satan working against God today? I have a whole list. We're going to go over that. Why, no, what is the mystery of iniquity that doth already work? What is the falling away in 2 Thessalonians? What is the, that would holdeth that Antichrists might re, be revealed in his time? Is it true that the Bible is for our learning, but not all of it is to and about us? And the answer is yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So we're going to see a um, couple of things. Um, the father wants to exalt the son. And the son and the father are exalted by the Holy Ghost. And, you know, the son also wants to exalt the father. So they want to exalt each other. So it's kind of like a triangle. And then we're going to find out another triangle in this letter today that Titus comforted Paul and Paul comforted the Corinthians. Now, this is a short review of last week, okay? So, last week we talked about, you know, um, that we can be um, sons and daughters of God if we understand what he, our instructions are, okay? So, let's imagine, as a review, that a farmer has three sons, and he tells his three sons, I used to plant potatoes. But now, I want to plant beets and preserve them. Okay? So, which one of the sons here is doing the father's will? Son number one goes out and plants potatoes. Mm -hmm. eh. <laughs> right? <laughs> Betty, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Son number two goes out and plants potatoes and beets. Mm -hmm. And son number three goes out and plants beets. So, is it one, two, or three? Three. Three. The one who plants beets, because that's what the Father is doing now. Okay? So, today, God is talking to the body of Christ through the scriptures that he gave to Paul. So, if you are saying, you know, preaching Peter, you're not preaching the right thing. If you're preaching Peter and mixing it with Paul, you're not doing the right thing. 
you have to do just paw. Okay? Okay. So, do you have a retirement plan for eternity? Last week we went over the three rights. You have to, you know, is God going to show you things in His Word? If you don't understand the gospel that is saves today, or if you don't believe that He's preserved His Word in a certain Bible, or if you can't rightly divide the Word of Truth, follow that rule that He gave, because he only gave it once, so we wouldn't get confused about it. God gives us his life, and his life wants to live through us as we renew our mind in his word. It's not about us. It's all about him. So, <clears throat> when uh, Christ shed the blood of the New Testament, that allowed the Father to impute his son's righteousness to two groups and right now he's imputing his righteousness to our group it, when we believe so by one cross Christ saved two groups to put now that word put is in the word impute input see input mm -hmm. so he put his spirit in them that's what he wants to do so see input ed okay He's going to put his spirit in those who believe. Imputed righteousness, which is also equivalent to his life and his spirit in us. And he has different instructions for his group that's going to live in heaven from his group that's going to live on earth. So, <clears throat> the body of Christ is God's one true church made up of believers to, from all nations, even Israel. So, to be uh, saved today, a Jew needs to believe just the same thing that we, in order to have eternal life. Same gospel. And we're going to have, as it says in 2 Corinthians, eternal in the heavens. That's where we're going to be. Okay. So, the dispensation of grace has been grafted in. And blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of Gentiles be come in, until the rapture, and then God will go back to dealing with Israel. So it's important not only to be dispensational, but I mean, not only to be biblical, but also to be dispensational, because God gives different instructions at different times to different people. And he says, this is the key to understanding the Bible, study to show thyself approved unto God, so we... We don't care what other people think about us. We care about what God thinks about us. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we don't want to be ashamed at the judgment seat of Christ, which is after the rapture for our service. And we have to divide the truth that belongs to the body of Christ from the truth that belongs to the rest of the people in the Bible. So we can read any part of the Bible, but we have to read it from a Pauline perspective, knowing that, you know, we are the body of Christ, and it's not necessarily talking about us, but it's for our learning. Okay? 2 Corinthians 2.15. I mean, Timothy. first, <laughs> 2 Timothy 2.15. Sorry about that. 2 Timothy 2.15. Okay. We have a few more of these. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. 1 Corinthians 1.17 Are you putting a lot of store in your baptism, water baptism? Okay. Are you degrading the cross of Christ? Okay. Lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Because water baptism is not part of what God is doing now. We have a spiritual baptism. Look at this. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been have been all made to drink into one spirit. So we all have 
that one spirit of Jesus Christ in us. And we're all, you know, drinking from that. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Galatians 3, 27. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male or nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3, 27 and 28. So spiritually, we're all the same. Okay, so a few more. Paul says, be ye followers of me in 4, 16 of 1 Corinthians. And my ways, which be in Christ, 4, 17. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11.1 1. So, here's a man who's saying, follow me to follow Christ. This is, he, he's saying this by inspiration of the Lord. For the past 2,000 years, Satan's mixed uh, strategy has been mixing Peter and Paul. But if you spend your whole time in you know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, an early act, you may never hear the true gospel. You might be unsaved. Um, God um, the, uh, said to um, Christ said to Luke. I mean, Christ said to his group, the Peter's group, in Luke twelve thirty two, "Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom." So Peter's group believe in Jesus Christ, and they're going to get the kingdom. Today, there's a present salvation opportunity for the Jews, like I've said, to join the body of Christ, to have eternal life. You think about it. Do you want to have eternal life or eternal death? Hmm, tough decision. <laughs> Christ has two ministries, one for his earthly believers, Peter's group, one for his heavenly believers, Paul's group. Okay, so in the Bible, a lot of people don't know there's two groups of people that God is saving. Israel is God's chosen people, and so is the body of Christ. He had chosen to make this group that's going to live in heaven before the foundation of the world. And last week we said idolatry is mixing Peter and Paul. Because it, you can't mix heavenly instructions with earthly instructions. It's just, you know, doesn't make any sense. We are all to be ambassadors of Christ. The Son's death and resurrection allows the Father to impute righteousness to two groups and to resurrect them. Okay? So, the testator, after he died and took the punishment that we deserved, and paid for Adam's and everybody's sins, that, and that blood of, allowed for the t New Testament to be um, introduced. And the Father could now impute his son's righteousness to two groups. So we are under the blood of the New Testament, as it says in 2 Corinthians 3, 6. We went over that when we were talking about chapter 3. And we're going to be able to, he's going to be able to resurrect. Not only do we have his spirit, we're going to be resurrected. Both groups. On Calvary, Jesus saved two groups to give them his spirit and is able to restore the two realms, heaven and earth. Remember we said that something, that that judgment, we're going to be talking about that when we get to our um, timeline for today. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways? So now we're talking about getting clean. By taking heed to thereto according to thy word. Psalm 119.9. So we cleanse ourselves with the Word of God. We need His to reprogram our mind with the mind of God. To be ungodly, just don't read your Bible. If you want to be godly, read your Bible. 
It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 6, 63. So, his words have, are spirit and they're life. It's life-giving words in the Bible. The worst thing you can do to yourself is not to read it. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5.16 So this is another way to cleanse ourselves. We are nobodies telling the world about a somebody. So what is the biggest blunder of the church? Saying that Acts 2 is the birthday of the church instead of Acts 9. Okay, we're almost done here, and I have felts for you today. Okay, so um, 1 Timothy chapter 1, 11 through 14. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Okay, all of this information in Romans to Philemon was committed to Paul's trust. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, and I obtained, but I obtained mercy, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord Jesus was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Okay? He was the first sinner saved into the body of Christ. We are equally bad, um, and if not even much worse than Paul was. We live in a new and different dispensation formerly kept secret. And we're going to talk about that. Peter did not know that God would save another group to live in heaven until Paul told him at that Jerusalem council. So, um, Paul says, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Romans eleven thirteen. So, he is the apostle, the one apostle, to the one um, body of Christ. And this is God's will, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay, so you might be saved, but you may not have come to the knowledge of truth. And uh, we're trying to help you do both. So, we want to have fruit unto holiness. Our spiritual growth is of more value than our material wealth and needs to be given our highest priority. So, I'm hoping that many of you would subscribe to our YouTube channel. Okay, so this is what's going to happen, okay? I'm, I'm telling you the end now. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are in therein, shall be burned up. Second Peter 3.10. Okay? So, heaven and earth are going to burn. This heaven and this earth is going to burn. A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. Proverbs 18.2. This is psychology. Okay? If you're spending so much time thinking about discovering yourself instead of thinking about, you know, outside of the box, <laughs> your box, yourself, onto what God is saying in His Word, then you're being foolish. Hope. What is our hope? Well, the rapture. The rapture is our hope to live in heaven, to be caught up in our new bodies and live in heaven. What is Israel's hope? 
To live on earth. To live on earth. Good, Patty. To live in the kingdom on earth with Jesus Christ. So when you're reading the Bible, it's really important to think, hmm, okay, I'm re reading Hebrews. What's their hope? Okay. Mm -hmm. The hope of the Hebrews is to live in the kingdom on earth. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Romans 7, 6. So <clears throat> God gave the law to show us how sinful we were. Not to try to keep it. So now we've been delivered from the law because we're not under law. We have the spirit of Jesus in us. So now we're going to live by faith in the word of God, rightly divided. For I was alive without the law once. Paul explains in Romans 7 that he was under grace and he had understood grace. But then he decided to put himself under the law and try to, you know, keep the rules and regulations. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Romans 7, 9. So once he started to do things in his flesh, keeping, you know, the law, instead of walking by faith in the words that Jesus Christ was giving them, then the sin that was dormant in his body revived. And, you know, he says, you know, the things that I hate, I did. <clears throat> the things that I didn't want to do, you know. And um, he, he had self-condemnation. He started becoming legalistic, critical, and judgmental. And that's what happens to people that believe that the body of Christ began in Acts 2. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> we're going to find that when we believe the word rightly divided, that it's going to work effectually in us, and it's going to cleanse us. Okay? For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. So, Paul was inspired to write what Christ wanted him to write. Which effectually worketh also in you that believe. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 So, the words rightly divided have life and spirit, and they're the ones that's going to cleanse us. Okay? Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it, the church, with the washing of water by the word. Okay? Mm -hmm. Ephesians 5, 25 and 26. So Christ cleanses us with his word. Not our husbands, but our husbands can help us. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and against such there is no law. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Do we want that in coming from us? Mm -hmm. Yes, we want to have the fruit of the Spirit. That I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Romans 15, 16. So the Holy Ghost in us is going to sanctify this group that we're in, the body of Christ. And, you know, Paul wants to be really proud of us when, when we get presented to the Father all together. So this is how the mechanics of how to have, you know, um, get rid of the filthiness of the flesh and spirit. That ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. 
the old man being the old Adamic nature, that we, who we were before we were saved, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So renewal takes place in our mind by his word. And that ye put on the new man, which is Jesus Christ, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Ephesians 4, 24, 22 through 24. Okay, so we're going to talk more about that in the first part of the lesson when I read it chapter and next week Paul said consider what I say and the Lord give thee understanding in all things 2nd Timothy 2 7 when we understand our message Romans 2 Philemon we're going to understand the rest of the Bible much better the body of Christ was a secret mystery hid in God Ephesians 3 9 until Christ revealed it to Paul. Okay, so God was so wise, he didn't reveal it until Paul, one year after the cross. We are no longer in sin once we're saved, but sin is still in us. We can say no to it. As we walk by faith in God's word to us, we sin less. But being made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness, Romans 6.18. So we want to serve God now. To get your thinking right, get your doctrine right. Okay, and God wants us to live holy lives. And we get righteousness by the doctrine. That's what he just said. Okay. All right, let's go over here and take a look at this. Okay. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. So what do we need? We need righteousness because there's none righteous. So when we believe the gospel, this was the last part of the puzzle. The last part of the puzzle was justification by faith. Paul was given the last information, the most advanced information from Jesus Christ. So it's, um, you know, justification by faith. So once someone believes what Christ has done, that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, when I believe that, my sin was placed by God on Jesus. And his righteousness was put on me or imputed. So this is the transaction that happened. Okay, so God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So now... He, he t made someone that had no sin to be sin. And then he made me, who was sinful, to be righteous. And once I have his life, his spirit, his righteousness, I was immediately baptized in, spiritually into the body of Christ. And now I'm in that group that we all belong to. And we're waiting to be raptured. Hallelujah. And yeah. he's the head. He's the head of the body. And the body is a group. Okay? The body is a group. He's the head of our group. Okay. So, the kingdom of God is made up of two realms. Heaven and earth. And we have, the Bible is laid out, prophecy, mystery, prophecy. Prophecy is from Genesis to Acts 9. Then mystery, Romans to Philemon. Then Prophecy again, Hebrews to Revelation. Where do we find this? Where do we find that big plan? It's right in this verse, Ephesians 1, 9, and 10. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, 
that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, which is the dispensation after everything burns, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Okay? So that's God's glory plan. That's his glory plan. Okay, so the heavens are not clean in his sight right now. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. And we wrestle against, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Sometimes we have wickedness on the earth, don't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Mm -hmm. So, we're going to go over this more next week, but we are spirit, soul, and body. And in our body dwells the sinful flesh. But when we believe what Jesus Christ had done, our, his spirit was joined with our spirit. And there was a circumcision that occurred spiritually so that our old sinful flesh are, was separated from our inner man. So when we read the Bible, and, you know, after believing the gospel, then the information goes into our minds. But when we believe what we've read, then it can work effectually in us, and it goes from our minds into our heart um, by the help of the Spirit. But God be thanked that ye were servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Romans 6.17 When we believe Pauline doctrine, we, we can live a victorious life. Let me see if I have anything here. Okay, so what we want, okay, okay, this is a verse that says we are spirit, soul, and body, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so he wants all these parts to be blameless. We are meant to be, live holy life, and we need indoctrination, the right doctrine to go into our minds. Okay, 2 Corinthians Review Sentences. I'm not seeing, uh, did I skip, did I skip something? I'm not seeing my list. Uh -oh. Let me see. Oh, here it is. Okay, this is how Satan is working today. Okay. All right. Uh, where's my pointer? Okay. He, how does Satan work today? He wants to keep the lost unsaved and the saved ignorant. The biggest group of people on the earth in Christendom is the ignorant brethren. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want you to know which Bible is the true word of God and which are the counterfeits. The fool has said in his heart there is no God. He doesn't want you to know the true gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Satan does not want anyone to believe the Son of God died in their place and that they will be resurrected like him. He doesn't want believers to know they have the Son's righteousness, His Spirit, His life in them. He works in the children of disobedience to set up a one-world government. He wants people to believe politicians can solve the problems of sinful man. Um, Satan wants to corrupt and destroy the world. 
He wants believers lulled into a false sense of security by ignorant pastors. Satan is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. What happened to Adam and Eve? Did they live forever? No. Satan made sure they were murdered, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's see. He wants people to think they are spiritual Israel. He wants people to be focused on things that have no eternal value. He wants believers to follow Peter instead of Paul or mix Peter and Paul. He wants believers preoccupied with prophecy instead of mystery. He wants believers arguing about the shape of the earth instead of ministry. He wants believers, okay, Satan wants us to believe that singing is worship when it's not. Singing is not worship. Reading the Bible rightly divided is worship. Wanting to know what God said. That's, and praying to Him. Okay. In an intelligent way. God must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. We have His spirit and His word is truth. He wants to convince people that they don't need to read the Bible daily. Satan wants you to think life is about you instead of God. Satan does not want you to understand the Bible rightly divided, 2 Timothy 2.15. He tricks people into introspection instead of looking to Jesus and his word. He doesn't want you to know that working is honorable. Having a job and working is an honorable thing. Um, yeah. So, chapter 6. Work with God. Share in this day of salvation. Um, you know, share the gospel. And separate from false teachers. That was chapter 6. And chapter 7. Corinthians, com the Corinthians comforted Titus. Titus comforted Paul. And Paul comforted the Corinthians. Okay. Okay. I know I forgot something. I I was going to do this when we had, you know, when we had that picture of the transaction. Mm -hmm. But I'll just do it here. Okay. Because this is so important that you get. Know ye not. You know, because obviously they didn't know, the Romans didn't know, some of them, that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Okay? We were baptized into the death of Jesus on the cross. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Romans 6, 3, and 4. So we were identified with his death, burial, and resurrection. Okay. Okay. So, here it is. Knowing this, that our old man, remember our old man Adam? Mm -hmm. Is crucified with him, that the body of sin, all of those wrong things that we used to do, might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Okay? We're not going to serve sin now. We want to live holy lives. We want to be, you know, um, model citizens for our country. Okay. So. And <clears throat> worthy. Now, in Israel's program, this is Israel's program. The they have to wa the priests have to wash their hands and their feet that they die not. Exodus 30:21. Okay. So. 
they're going to be a kingdom of priests with a Jesus Christ being the you know the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek and the 12 apostles are going to rule over the 12 tribes. Jesus said to them, to his 12 apostles, you shall, that in the regeneration, once, you know, the kingdom on earth is here, um, ye shall sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, so the Lord Jesus Christ is the high priest for Israel that has made a new and living way through the veil that is his flesh to go before the into the holies of holies before the Holy Father you know following their high priest who you know presented his blood up there so that now they can follow him because under the new covenant they'll have his spirit in them so they won't be obliterated when they get there you know get before the father <clears throat> okay same thing with us when we have his spirit we won't be obliterated so in Re Revelation 26 it says blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection that's when Peter's going to be resurrected on such the second death has no power okay the second death is where all the people who have never believed what God said to them is going but they shall be priests of God and of Christ okay Israel's going they're going to be priests we're going we're ambassadors and shall reign with him a thousand years revelation 20 verse 6 so that's his they'll reign with him the first thousand years and then they'll reign with him for eternity. Okay. All right. So what happened was that Paul went up um, after he was forced to leave Ephesus, where this blue thing is. He went up to Troas and waited for um, Titus for a week, and he didn't come. So he started getting really worried about what the Corinthians might have done to Titus. So then he decides to, you know go into Macedonia. So he took this Ignatian way and he went into Macedonia and he runs into Titus. And we're going to be talking about that today. MarianneManley.com is my website. There's lots of free PDFs there. Truth Be Told is our YouTube channel. I mean, not ours. It's a YouTube channel that hosts our videos plus other Grace videos. Salvation Rightly Dividing and the Rapture, that's our YouTube channel, and we hope that you subscribe. We were really blessed that our last message somehow touched a nerve, and many people saw it. So we're grateful for that. Okay, let's go back over here now. And um, before we get into um, our lesson, um, that you know, all the verses. Okay, this is the timeline that I'm going to tell you about, but we're not going to do that quite yet. Okay, before we do that, let's do our books. So, God's Secret is the most important book to get. It is an overview of the whole Bible in a hundred pages. And it will give you, um, teach you how to rightly divide the word of truth. And even if you've been, uh, you know, doing this for a long time, it will solidify your, your information and help you to be more effective. And it comes in color, get the color, and black and white. And all these books are available on Amazon. And then we, it also comes in, in hardcover. And I'm so happy that uh, many groups have been, you know, teaching through God's secret as the beginning of their ministry. And um, this is how we started our Bible study. We talked through that. Okay, and it also comes in Spanish and it comes in Norwegian. It also comes in Hindi and Nepali. And if you want to translate it, please contact me. 
then you would want to read Romans a concise commentary because once you've mastered the big picture you want to get right into Paul's epistles and it comes in color or in black and white and this in chapter 14 talks all about you know the five courses of punishment for Israel and um, it's an, in an easy to understand way 1st Corinthians a commentary, 2nd Corinthians a commentary I'm reading that with my daughter Galatians a commentary, Ephesians a commentary Philippians, Colossians, Philemon a commentary, all of these have um, you know it has the verses in bold and then the commentary in between there so you can see for yourself if you agree with the commentary. The commentary are mostly from Grace Pastors, their comments condensed and made uh, easily re readable. The certainty of the pre-tribulation rapture comes in black and white or in color. Now in this book I have the most incredible map of um, well, I, I might not be able to find it right now, but it's it's about the Seleucid. It, it shows how the king of the north and the king of the south both had uh, their hand in uh, Jerusalem. Remember, both owned own part of Jerusalem. Which book was that? That was the certainty of the pre-tribulation rapture. Mm -hmm. You you would definitely want to read that, which is First and Second Thessalonian commentary, which we're going to go over. A little of Second Thessalonians today. Paul's pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Uh, here is a good book that I did not write. This is by C. R. Stam. Things that differ. Okay, and um, that's also on Amazon. How to be saved made simple. Many people are getting that, and God's secret in black and white, which is under four dollars. To hand out to people. I carry some in my car. Rightly Dividing Roman Study Guide, Rightly Dividing First Corinthians Study Guide, and now we're doing Rightly Dividing Second Corinthians Study Guide. Next we'll do Rightly Dividing Galatians Study Guide. So after I finish Second Corinthians I'm going to Chicago for the conference with Pastor Jordan and um, that's July 16th through the 21st. And Nancy's going with me. Hey, hey. <laughs> Just as God said, it's a children's book um, with lots of colored pictures for uh, rightly dividing. And could God have a 7,000 year plan for mankind? Is the same pretty much as AD 34. So you don't need both, just one. And then we have, why was the earth without form, void, and dark, in more detail. And Mr. Rapture, read this commentary on Hebrews. Now, this is meaty. I wouldn't start there. I would start with Romans. First, um, uh, I mean, Acts of the Apostles commentary, part 1, 2, and 3, is also meaty. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to start with, with those. You'd, you'd want to start with Romans and then go through the epistles in order. Oh. There. I might have to hand these to you, Nancy. There we go. And then last but not least, Treasure Hunt, Volume 1, 2, and 3, which is all of Paul's epistles. Okay. <clears throat> So let's go over our felts. Okay. So um, in uh, we're going to find out that in this chapter seven, Paul is going to pick up where he left off in chapter two, verse thirteen. Which he said, furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit, because I found not Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went thence into Macedonia. 
So Paul has left and he's gone into Macedonia. And he's going to run into Titus. So Timothy had first gone to Corinth. And he said there's still a problem there. So then Paul had dispatched Titus to, you know, straighten him out. And now he runs in to Titus. He and Timothy run into Titus in Macedonia. And Titus is going to say, your letter did the job. The, many of the Corinthians have a fervent mind toward you and have obeyed your apostolic commands and they can't wait to see you again. So that's going to just thrill his heart. Titus, we are so happy to see you. And so they were so happy. So Titus is, this is like a, a little word bubble, you know. He's telling them the Corinthians are behind, many of the Corinthians are behind him now. Most of them. And Paul is preaching the gospel, that uh, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to Revelation of the Mystery. So, the dispensation of grace that we live in was first and only given to Apostle Paul. And um, the body of Christ is not mentioned outside of his letters. So, the twelve apostles, so, so we have one apostle to one body of Christ. See how that works? Mm -hmm. And the 12 apostles, you know, 12 is the number for Israel. 12 tribes, 12 apostles. Uh, in Christ's earthly ministry. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? 1 Corinthians 15, 12. So one of the reasons he wrote 1 Corinthians was that some of them were saying there was no resurrection of the dead. You know, you die and you go like an animal, you know, into the ground. And that's it. That's what they were saying. So he had to straighten them out on that. And so he said in 2 Corinthians 2, 4, this is why he wrote 1 Corinthians. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears, not that ye should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. So he did it out of love. He wrote that letter to straighten them out because when we love somebody, we want to straighten them out. It's if they're going wrong. Okay. Alright. Let's do this one now. In Ephesians 2, 1 through 4. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So the believer was dead in trespasses and sins, but we been made alive spiritually. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. So in the past, we were under Satan's control. And everyone who's not saved is subject to Satan's control. Okay? They are subject to being, you know, taken in, along with the course of this world. Going just along with that. And the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So that is the spirit that's working in the children of disobedience. The, the prince of the power of the air. Which is Satan. Do you have to go? Okay. Okay. Okay, Cheryl is leaving. Okay, hurry because, you know, we're holding up the show here. Okay, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of the flesh, in the lust of our flesh, Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, were which he loved us. So God loved us. 
-hmm. And, you know, now we have his spirit in it. Patty, please sit down, mm -hmm. honey. Um, and, and um, yeah, we're trying not to make a lot of noise. All right, so this is very important. How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect? Okay, this is why Jesus Christ did not reveal this information until after the cross, one year after the cross. So Paul says that we are speaking wisdom to them that are perfect. The people that are perfect are the ones that believe that Paul is the apostle. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world, that come to naught. It's not the world's wisdom. This is God's wisdom. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, comma. Even the hidden wisdom, comma. So the hidden wisdom is the appositive for the mystery which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Second Corinthians, no, First Corinthians, chapter 2, 6 through 8. Okay? So here it is. Satan would not have allowed the princes of this world, the ones that he was empowering, as the, uh, you know, to crucify the Lord of glory. If he had known that God had a mystery, some hidden wisdom, which is the, the hidden wisdom is the formation of the body of Christ during the dispensation of grace. So now... And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly. So Jesus Christ, on the cross, made a show of Satan and his followers, the fallen angels, openly, triumphing over them in it, in the cross. So he's now spoiled the principalities. He's taken, he's able to save two groups of people and give them his spirit. He's taken back these people who were under Satan's control. Okay? Okay. All right. So let's talk about the mystery of iniquity. If you look over here in this corner. So we have the mystery of iniquity. There has been rebellion in heaven and on earth. So, Lucifer, who was the anointed cherub, became Satan. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. Ezekiel 28.15 So iniquity was found in Lucifer. That's where it began. The mystery of iniquity began with Lucifer. Okay? And Jesus Christ said, Unto them I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Luke 10, 18. So remember that earth that was without form, void, and dark? That's where he went. He fell from heaven when he was cast out to that earth. And then God wanted to get him off of it, so he made it inhospitable. And they went up into the second heaven. Why is that important? Because that's why he needs us, the body of Christ, to make the second heaven all better again. Okay? See, it's starting to gel. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's talk about rebellion on the earth. <clears throat> so, we find out in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians that uh, Satan appeared as an angel of light to Eve. 
but he his nature was like a serpent. And he said to her, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Genesis 3, 5. So he persuaded Eve that, you know, you don't have to have God be your God. You could be God, you know. And this is the lie. The lie is that Satan or any creature is God. Because what did Satan say in himself? This is what he said. This is the iniquity that was found in, in Lucifer. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations, Gentile nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That's in Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. So this is iniquity right here that was in him. When he was saying these things that, you know, I'm going to take the place of the Son of God. Okay? I'm, you know, better than him. That's what he was basically trying to say. So this whole thing is going to be said again about Lucifer. Remember, you said all those things at the second coming. This is what Israel, the little flock, is going to say about Lucifer at the second coming. He's going to say, this is what you said up there when iniquity began with you. Okay? So, <clears throat> with that in mind, um, we're going to get into our chapter, and then we're going to see that second, the falling away. Okay, so here's our chapter. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved. Okay, maybe I should do the timeline first. Okay. All right, let me do the timeline first. Okay. All right, so notice here. <clears throat> Can you see? Okay, we had the original heaven. It was perfect. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And we had the beginning, the earth. The original earth was perfect. God makes everything perfect. Mm -hmm. Then we had the chaotic earth. Okay? And then we had this heaven being not clean in his sight. Mm -hmm. Then we're, we had the restored earth where Adam and Eve could live with God. Okay? So then, then we know Adam and Eve fell. Okay? They fell, and then um, that was the fall of the human race. Then we had um, Noah, and then we had the Tower of Babel. So at the Tower of Babel, the Gentiles were given up. Mm -hmm. Then God called out Abraham. Then there came Moses, David, and Daniel. Then came John and Jesus, the Son of God. And then he died on the cross, was buried, and rose again. Then God sent down the Holy Ghost on the little flock, okay? And then they preached a renewed offer of the kingdom. Uh, but the leaders rejected it by stoning Stephen. So then God appeared, Jesus Christ appeared to Paul, who was called Saul of Tarsus. And he began a new dispensation of grace. And that's called the mystery. And this dispensation of grace will end at his next appearance. At the, and we will be caught up. So between his appearance to Paul and his appearance to rapture us, that is a parenthesis that we live in. The dispensation of grace. Once we're caught up with him, to meet him in the air, then he's going to restart Israel's program. We don't know how long it will take to before Antichrist signs the seven-year agreement and the tribulation begins. 
and then will be the the second coming of Christ. So we have prophecy, and then we have mystery, and then we have prophecy, Hebrews to Revelation. So this is Romans to Philemon. Now, this was the fall and the diminishing of Israel. So those Gentiles that he had given up here at the Tower of Babel is now getting another chance to be saved. All people are getting a chance to be saved. So after his second coming, then he'll set up the 1,000 year reign. Then he'll have, there'll be another little fire sent on the uh, rebellious Gentiles after Satan lets, is let loose. And then the great white throne judgment and death and hell and all the lost will be thrown into the lake of fire. And God will make a new heaven, new earth. Okay? So, our earth over here, over here, is going to, heaven and earth is going to burn. It's going to burn. Okay? So, it, it, it got burned right, right after, you know, the great white throne judgment. That old heaven and earth got burnt up. Okay? Because what did Jesus say? Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Matthew 24, 35. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so right about now we're feeling sorry for Cheryl that she's missing this. Okay, so here we go with our chapter 7. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the Spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Okay? So all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Because we're going to be perfecting holiness. Anything, and I'm going to say now, the Spirit is in our mind. Okay? The spirit is in our minds. So we're going to have clean minds, and we're not going to do bad things with our body. So now he says, receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. So he's willing, he's happy that he's, that he's doing all this if it means that, you know, they're going to, to live together in heaven. And that it's going to work for their benefit. So um, he's begging them to receive us. We're, you know, I'm the apostle of the Gentiles. You know? Okay. All right. We'll, we'll go over that a little bit later. So that was to verse 4. Here we go, 5 through 7. For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side, with outward fightings, with inward fears. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you, when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. Okay? We saw that in the felt story. Okay. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. Okay, let's 
This one is the door. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold, the self same thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, <laughs> what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. So he's like a cheerleader, isn't he? Yeah. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. So what is the repentance to salvation there? What is their repentance? We're going to show you that in, in our lesson. Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. Ah, there it is. Okay, what's back here? Oh, okay. Therefore we were comforted in your comfort, yea, and exceedingly the more joyed we for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. For if I have boasted anything to him of you, I am not ashamed. But as we spake all things to you in truth, even so our boasting, which I made before Titus, is found of truth. And his inward affection is more abundant toward you, whilst he remembereth the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling ye received him. I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you in all things. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the mystery and iniquity. And now you know that, and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. So we're trying to figure out, you know, what is withholding that Antichrist will be revealed when he signs that seven year covenant with Israel and sets up. In the middle of the tribulation, he'll set himself and and a, a statue of himself up in the temple. Okay. Okay. So the what that withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time, that Antichrist might be revealed. The what is the dispensation of grace that we're living in? That's holding back God from starting restarting his program with Israel. Okay? For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Okay? So the mystery of iniquity does already work. It's been working since Lucifer. Okay? Mm -hmm. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. So the he here is the one new man, the body of Christ. Okay? So, he is preventing until the rapture. Okay? Mm -hmm. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. So, that wicked is Antichrist. He's going to be revealed after we're gone. So, we're not going to know during this dispensation who's going to sign that seven-year contract who's Antichrist is. Mm -hmm. Whom the Lord will, shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. So the spirit of his mouth is the sword of his mouth, his word. He's going to use that to destroy Antichrist at his second coming. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So it's going to be dark on the earth when the Lord comes and he, he, he has a bright shining light. It will be dramatic. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now, Satan is, a, 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 you know, in, going to be in, um, embodying Antichrist. And he's going to be able to do powers and signs and lying wonders to fake it 
the Antichrist is Christ. And it will be things like calling down fire from heaven. It will be dramatic things. Mm -hmm. And causing wind to blow. You know, like the wind that destroyed Job's uh, children. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Okay. And with all deceivableness, so there's going to be lots of deceiving going on, and unrighteousness in them that perished, the unbelievers, because they received not the love of the truth. They didn't care about the Bible. They have avoided reading what God said to them. That they might be saved. The Bible is the only thing that saves us today. It's going to be the only thing that saves them then. Okay. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. Okay. So God's going to give them what they want, strong delusion, that they will believe the lie that a human being can be God. Okay. The Antichrist is God. Um. That they should believe a lie, okay, that a creature can be God, whether it's, you know, Satan in the man. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, 6 through 12. Okay, now, let's see what's behind this. Okay. Alright, so <clears throat> this is what God's doing now. He said, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So He's offering free, for free redemption to anyone who believes. Okay? Because you can be justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through, his, through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, for you know everyone that believed in the past, um, such as Abraham, through the forbearance of God, God didn't destroy him because he knew that his son was going to be able to impute his righteousness to him. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Romans 3, 23 through 26. So, God can, the Father can remain just and justify whoever believes in Jesus because he can now give him, uh, you know, the Christ imputed righteousness mm -hmm. to the believer. Okay, so this is what's going to happen to us. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them that are asleep, those have, who have died, that ye sorry not even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them... Also, we sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him? So, the bodies of our loved ones that died in believing in Christ is going to come with Christ as he meets us in the air. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. This is something that, you, that he's saying by inspiration. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. We're not going to go before them, for the dead in Christ are going to rise first. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of an archangel, and with a trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. First Thessalonians 4.15 and seven, uh, 218. So that's um, our, um, you know, hope. 
And um, so how do we live godly lives? For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. Okay, so the grace of God appeared to all men. Here. Because it was given to Paul that it, all men can be saved in this dispensation without going through Israel. Okay? <clears throat> and so now that, okay, so the grace was at the cross, it, but the, you know, it didn't, wasn't explained. That he to our group until Paul. Yeah. So it was the the grace of God to you know to do the cross, yeah. teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this world, present world. So we're going to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. We're just going to say no. Okay. And we're going to live soberly. That's you know we. Seriously, mm -hmm. righteously, and godly. We, we're going to live like this in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, Titus, okay, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous for good works Titus 2 11 through 14 so we're looking for that glorious appearing here that that blessed hope which is <laughs> when he comes back for us right here we're looking for that blessed hope so like I said we're between these two appearings okay let's get um, Going with the rest of our chapter, if you can do all, okay, all of the videos. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so please turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Okay. And um, this is only four pages, it's not even four. Okay, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So that's verse 1, 7 1. Since God has given us these promises to live eternal in the heavens, to have the Son's righteousness by faith, Okay, eternal in the heavens was in 5.1. Righteousness by faith was 5.21. And that he will have a father to son relationship with us, 6.18. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh, sinful actions. And spirit, thoughts contrary to God. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Paul's group is to live worthy of our position as ambassadors, representing Jesus Christ in his ministry of reconciliation of Gentiles in mystery bound for heaven. After our rapture, Peter's group will be a kingdom of priests helping Gentiles in prophecy to be saved into the kingdom on earth. Exodus 19, 5 and 6, 1 Peter 2, 9. If we think the four Gospels and early Acts are for us in mystery, then we put ourselves under the law. Paul said the law activates our sinful flesh, Romans 7, 9. We start thinking and doing things we hate and become legalistic, judgmental, and critical. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, Galatians 5, 16. His word in our minds and heart works in our lives, 1 Thessalonians 2.13. The Spirit uses His Word to make us useful when we obey from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness, Romans 7, 6, 17 and 18. Our thinking determines our behavior. Our spirit is in our minds, 
we have victory over the flesh when we make a conscious decision to put off our old man, our old Adamic sin we do when we when in the flesh as we put on the new man Christ as we re renew or reprogram our minds in his word rightly divided Ephesians 4:22 through 24 we just say no i am not doing that sinful behavior because that is not who i am anymore when we have a bad thought, we say, I'm taking that thought captive. I refuse to think about that. Do not behave like the lost. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. For God hath not called us to uncleanness, but unto holiness. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 7. So we're not going to behave like the lost. Christ cleanses us with his word. Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present him, it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. The grace doctrine transforms us and our conduct from the inside out into the image of his Son. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. 3.18 Satan does not want us to know that the life of Jesus is in us. 4.11 Grace teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Titus 2.14, 2.12, I mean. We want to be gracious to others so they will be willing to hear the message of Christ. We need to cleanse ourselves from false doctrine and not be reluctant to leave those who teach that the body of Christ began in Acts 2. We need to study God's word, his way, and divide the truth where God divides it, 2 Timothy 2.15. Paul said, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. 2 Timothy 2.7 Paul's letters are directly to and about us in the body of Christ. But the rest of the Bible is for our learning. Romans 15.4 We study all the Bible from a Pauline perspective. God through Paul has told us to separate from following Christ's earthly ministry. 5.16, Romans 15.8, and to follow Paul, to follow Christ, 1 Corinthians 1.11. There is nothing wrong with either the law or Christ's ministry on earth. It's just not our instructions. When we trust the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, Romans 16.25, we produce the fruit of the Spirit unto holiness, Galatians 5.22. To 23. Verse 2. Receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. Our doctrine is what will help you live holy lives. So Corinthians, please receive us. Paul defends himself because the false ministers accused him of what they were doing. They wronged, degraded, and swindled them. Paul wanted all of them to realize that his apostleship was Christ's message to the Gentiles from the Lord in this dispensation. Romans 11, 13, 15, 16, Ephesians 3, 1 through 9. But Satan's policy of evil is to conceal the mystery Christ gave to Paul. 3. I speak not to condemn you, for I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live, for, and live with you. 
yeah, in our hearts to die and live with you. Paul is not saying this to find fault with them. He is making an appeal to them to believe he and his co-workers are true ministers of Christ. He has said before that their heart's desire is to die and live with them in heaven, 4, 14 through 16. God's glory plan, see I have it right here, glory plan, mm -hmm. is to populate heaven and earth with two different groups of people that believe what he said, Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. Believers will glorify his son, the son and the father will glorify each other, and the Holy Ghost will glorify both. All believers will have part in this glorious celebration for all eternity. 4. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. Paul had great boldness to compare his ministry with Christ and all other ministries with Belial. Remember that last week? I praise you for what I now hear. I am full of comfort and overflowing with joy. You made all our tribulations worth it. 5. For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, and within were fears. Paul now continues where he left off in chapter 2.13. Uh, in in, yeah. In this chapter. In verse, it should say verse. Okay. Mm -hmm. Verse. 13. Okay, let me write that. Okay. When we came in, uh, came to Macedonia, we were restless. There were struggles from without and fears within. Paul was fearful that Satan may cause more in Corinth to turn away from him. He worried after Titus did not show up when and where expected. He probably also wondered how things would turn out in Ephesus after his nearly three-year ministry there ended abruptly in one day. Joys, sorrows, fears, and questions crowded his mind. Paul wanted all people to believe the good news of Calvary and be freely saved by faith. Romans 3, 21 through 26, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, 6 and 7. Nevertheless, God that comforted those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. But God who comforts the downcast comforted us with the coming of Titus. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoiced the more. Titus told Paul that many Corinthians fervently believed Paul was the apostle of the Gentiles and that the dispensation of grace began with him in Acts 9. 1 Timothy 1, 15, 16, Ephesians 3, 2. Paul was not only comforted by his warm reunion with Titus, but by how Titus was consoled and comforted by the genuine sorry, sorrow and fervent mind toward me, which made me rejoice even more. Many who mourned over their sins of preaching something other than what Paul said were on fire for Paul again and were eager to see him, so he rejoiced. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Paul had been wondering that maybe the letter he sent was too stern, and that perhaps he should not have sent it. But the letter had been effective. It had done its work in their hearts. They had real sorrow for a season. In 1 Corinthians, Paul corrects the, their thinking, conduct, and service to God. What matters is Christ crucified, not the wisdom of men. He calls them carnal and babes as he deals with the division among them. Their overemphasis on temporary sign gifts 
uh, and going to public courts to solve their disputes. He told them that God had a secret plan to form the body of Christ that Satan did not know about because it was not in the Bible yet. If Satan had known, he would not have allowed Christ to be crucified. 1 Corinthians 2, 6-8 He told them about the judgment seat of Christ. He informed them that he was the steward of the mysteries, the master builder. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 of the dispensation that God had entrusted to him. 1 Corinthians 9.17 He defended his apostleship and wanted them to follow him as he follows Christ, not 10,000 instructors. 1 Corinthians 4.16, 17, 11, 1 he said that they were puffed up and should have dealt with a fornicator by putting him out of the assembly. Paul is always careful to give all the glory to Christ who is in him. Then he answered their questions on about marriage, eating food offered to idols, and the resurrection. They should not be unbelievers like Israel in the wilderness. He corrected them regarding respectfully celebrating the Lord's death with the Lord's Supper and restored order in the church. He told them that sign gifts would end when he had received the full revelation of the mystery, 1 Corinthians 13, 8-13, and to do everything with charity. He said that just as the resurrection of Christ was a proven witness fact, so is our rapture, resurrection. He ended the letter telling them that he would visit, but not yet because he had a great opportunity in Ephesus. In the meantime, he wanted them to take up a collection for Peter's group in Jerusalem. Paul said, If any man think himself to be spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord, but if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. 1 Corinthians 14, 37 and 38, 9. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye, may, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. Now I rejoice, not because I made you sorry, sorry but because you sorrowed to the point that you changed your mind and obeyed my apostolic authority and dealt with the offender. The letter worked effectually for you sorrowed in a godly way. We wrote it so we would not leave you with spiritual damage, uncorrected, and continuing to do wrong. It is loving to correct people when they are in error. Ten. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Godly sorrow works to save us from error. We are never sorry for believing God's truth, but the sorrow of the world leads to death. The sorrow of the world is characterized by self-pity, blaming others, or ourselves, which may result in depression, self-absorption, and suicide. 18.2, Proverbs 18.2 Satan wants to deceive people so they die and go to hell. 11. For behold, this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sword, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourself, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge, in all things ye have proved yourself to be clear in this matter. The Corinthians sorrowed after a godly sort, changed their minds, and obeyed their apostle. They cleared their minds of the wrong thinking that resulted in wrong action, and even cleared up their own fornication. Your sorrow was the godly kind when you realized your error. You demonstrated regret and removed the fornicator from your assembly. By putting him out of the assembly, you vindicated yourself of condoning the fornicator's sin. You became indignant of his sin, feared God, and did what was right. 
Your vehement zeal led you to carry out the appropriate punishment of the offender, revenge. You proved your obedience to God's word by clearing yourself of any guilt of condoning the incest. 1 Corinthians 5.1 12. Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for the his cause that had done the wrong, nor for the cause of nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. I did not write the letter for the sake of the person that did wrong, nor for the sake of the person that was wronged, but for your sakes, that the letter was to let you know the love and care we have for you before God. 2.4 Therefore, we were... 13. We were comforted in your comfort, yea, and exceedingly the more joyed we for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. Last page. We were comforted by you when we united with Titus. We were exceedingly joyful for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was so invigorated by your response to him. Their obedience to Paul's instructions refreshed and boosted his spirit. Paul was delighted by the respectful way Titus was received and believed. 14. For if I have boasted anything to him of you, I am not ashamed. But as we spake all things to you in truth, even so our boasting which I made before Titus is found of truth. If I boasted of you to Titus, I am not ashamed of anything I said to him. For just as we spoke all things to you in truth, even so our bragging about you turned out to be true. Paul is proud of them, for they responded to the letter just as he told Titus they would. 15. And his inward affection is more abundant toward you, whilst he remembereth the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling ye received him. Titus's job was to convince the Corinthians that Christ is indeed working his heavenly ministry through Paul. Ephesians 2 6. Titus was happy that many of them were now zealous to follow Paul. They had respectfully welcomed him and listened to what he had to say about Christ's true ministry to them through Paul. The abundant love Titus has in his heart for you is evident. He is remembering your concern and willingness to obey my apostolic instruction in the letter. You welcomed him with trepidation and trembling. Paul had once trembled with godly fear for the sake of their salvation. 1 Corinthians 2.3 Last verse. I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you all in all things. Paul is relieved and rejoices that most of them had wisely obeyed his apostolic authority and directions. His love and care for them in his letters were working. They had obeyed in the matter concerning the fornicator, so Paul hoped they will do right in all things. He is confident that they are on the right track, moving in the right direction of following Paul to follow Christ. Although his ministry at Ephesus had been dealt a big blow, it seemed the Corinthians uh, were doing well, that Corinth was doing well. Souls were saved in strategic areas. The Corinthians comforted Titus, who comforted Paul, and now Paul comforted them. He knew that his next visit to them would be an enjoyable one. That ends our, our lesson today. Dear Father God, we thank you for your incredible word to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Bye, everybody. We'll see you next week for lesson chapter eight, 2 Corinthians chapter 8.